This video is sponsored by Recharge Resources. Hey, this is Warren Redlick. Investor Day is coming about two weeks away. This is going to be the most important presentation I think we're gonna see from Tesla for a while. This may be the most important presentation we've ever seen. Everything that Tesla is doing depends on one thing and one thing only, getting sufficient battery materials to deliver everything else. Master Plan 3 is coming. It is the path to a fully sustainable future. The number one thing that we need to hear from Tesla looking out to 2026, 2030, 2040, is how is Tesla going to ensure that there are sufficient battery materials, whether it's lithium, it's nickel, it's graphite, it's manganese, copper, there's all these elements that are in the Earth's crust that need to be extracted and refined in order to be able to make the batteries and the other products that Tesla wants to, to produce. And right now, it's not clear. There's a lot of voices saying, hey, the minerals aren't there. There's a lot of, that I've seen multiple people. Peter Zahan is one of them. He's not the only one. Even Tesla themselves acknowledge there's a problem. This is the big challenge. There's a lot else that's going to happen on Investor Day. We're going to hear about the Gen 3 vehicle. There may be some other details, but this is the number one thing, and we're going to dive into it. When we talk about Investor Day, we're talking not just about Tesla. We're talking about the entire ecosystem for electric vehicles, for solar panels, for electrification of our lives, for expanding away from fossil fuels and into renewable energy, whether it's solar, battery storage, there's a whole bunch of things. And it's not just for Tesla. It's not just for us as investors. It's not just for customers. This is for everyone on earth. If we want to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy and transportation, that is something we need to do for everyone on earth, not just for Tesla investors, not just for Tesla customers. And that's, and it'll be a message of good hope and positivity. So we, Elon is very positive about where this is going. I think I've heard hints from other members of the Tesla team. They know where this is going. They believe this is doable. So we're gonna get into it. The first thing I wanna mention is, in the Investor Day tweet and, and, and documents that have come out, there's this image. And it's sort of, there was some initial question about what is this image? And Corey Steuben from Monroe, Monroe and Associates came up with this, that this, is from the image, and this looks a lot like Model Ys that have been stacked, and they've seen this image before. So it appears that Tesla is going to talk about scale, like this, you know, what does this represent? Why are they doing this? One theory that I think is the most common theory is this just represents the scale of how much is needed in order to get there. I have my own theory, and I'm probably wrong, that somehow this is a representation of some kind of chemical structure that's relevant to what Tesla needs to do. I've asked a bunch of my friends about it. Everyone says I'm wrong, so I'm probably wrong, and I'm hoping I can be less wrong, but I still have a gut hunch that somehow this might be something related to battery chemical structure or the mineral structure of something that goes in batteries, like lithium. It's just a, it's a wild guess, and I'm probably wrong. So I want to get back to this fundamental point. The most important thing is scaling the extraction and refining of battery materials, especially lithium, but also nickel, graphite, and more, copper, manganese. There's a whole bunch of things that are going into batteries that are necessary to get the batteries to scale to where we need them to scale. Currently, global production of batteries is less than one terawatt hour or 1,000 gigawatt hours. We need to get to a world where we're producing at least 10 terawatt hours and maybe 20 or 30 terawatt hours of battery materials for the world as a whole. Not just for Tesla, but for the world as a whole. On a yearly basis, we need to get to 300 terawatt hours or maybe 400 terawatt hours or 400,000 gigawatt hours of batteries out there to stabilize the grid, to provide enough batteries for vehicles. There's so much that needs to be done and that's the requirement. That's where we have to get to. And that requires extracting a ridiculous amount of these minerals from the Earth's crust and we, we don't currently have the infrastructure, the, the setup to extract those materials, so something has to change. One of the things that has to change is we need more battery materials, and in particular, lithium is the number one thing we need. Now, this is the sponsored part of the video. We're gonna get back to Drew Baglino and Tesla's plans for the future in a second. And I wanna say right now, I'm talking about Recharge Resources, it's a, Recharge is a battery metals company with lithium assets in Canada and Argentina. And before I dive deeper, I just want to disclose, this is a sponsored video. This is not financial advice. Do your own due diligence. 
Never invest off the information I provide. You got to use your own judgment. And I just want to mention really quickly, Recharge Resources is stock ticker RR in Canada, and it's R-E-C-H-F on the over-the-counter market, the OTC market in the United States. So this is from Recharge's website, and in particular, they have a project they're working on in Argentina, Positos One. It's an 800 hectare lithium brine project. You can get really in depth into what they're doing here. They're compiling geographically. They're in the early stages of getting to the point where they may be able to extract a meaningful amount of lithium from this location. They have other projects. They're working on a whole bunch of places, but this is one of the things that they're working on right now. So there's a long history of research into this area, the Salars in Argentina, which I think actually Drew Beglino mentioned at some point, uh, that he's going to mention some point later in here. The surface sampling campaigns, and they've found lithium, some form of lithium in their searches. And, you know, it's not to the point where we know this will be a productive extraction site, but they're making progress. Everything, as best I know, everything looks good. Again, do your own due diligence. I don't know enough. The previous company that was investigating this did not pursue it because there was a high magnesium content in the brines. And... Recharge Resources' view is that advances in direct lithium extraction and solvent exchange technology have perfected new methods of the sustainable production of lithium carbonate. I think CO3 is carbonate from brines. So the view is that Argentina is set to become a top lithium producer globally with demand for lithium batteries growing every day. And Recharge has completed a successful drill program to establish the size of their lithium deposit in Argentina. Recharge has signed a license agreement to build up to a 20,000 ton per year lithium extraction plant in Argentina and has signed a letter of intent with China's Richling Capital to supply up to 20,000 tons of lithium per year. Right now, lithium is trading at $70,000 US dollars per ton in the spot market. So there's a lot of potential here for this to go somewhere. And my, my view is really simply this, Tesla can't do it alone. We need innovators, we need entrepreneurs, we need investors to pursue other ways and finding other angles to get lithium. The more lithium that we produce as a society, the better we're gonna be in terms of heading towards this transition to sustainable energy. Lithium is a critical feature in that sustainable energy future. And I, I, I haven't done my own in-depth research on recharge resources yet. This is just a suggestion. This may be something worth looking at. Look at other companies like that. I personally invested in the LIT ETF, which is an exchange traded fund recommended by Ross Gerber, by the way. I think there's a lot of potential to see a lot of different approaches to extracting lithium from the earth one way or another. It's what we need for the future. I'm excited that Recharge Resources is trying to do it. Yes, I'm this is a sponsored video. They did pay me to make this video, but I'm genuinely excited about it. You got to do your own due diligence, figure out what you want for yourself. But with that said, let's move on to what Drew Baglino thinks about needing to change the way we extract materials in order to secure the future of having sufficient batteries to get the transition to sustainable energy. You need the materials, and then you need to produce the batteries, and then you need to produce the cars and the grid storage devices. You can't do it until you have the lithium or other battery materials that are needed. And Recharge Resource is just one of many companies that are trying to make that happen. We are at that point where the exponential growth curve becomes really painful. You know, when you're talking about uh, something that you make five of, making 10 of it the next year, that's easy. This is Drew Baglino. He's arguably the number two guy at Tesla. He's the guy who spoke with Elon at Battery Day. He's on every investor call. He's in charge of the supercharger network. He appears to be in charge of 4680 cell production. He seems to be involved very heavily with vehicle production. I think he's very involved with grid storage. I don't think he's involved deeply in the AI. I don't think he's involved deeply in, in FSD. He drives it, but I don't think that's other people in charge of that. But he has, he is probably the number two engineer in the company behind Elon. Um, very important guy, uh, really. Baglino Fan Club t-shirts, by the way, are available at elonbits.com, so I'd encourage you to check that out. Tesla Nair shirt, the Tesla Man shirt. While we're talking about Baglino, we'll talk about the t-shirts. All that at elonbits.com. But let's keep going with Drew. We are at that point where the exponential growth curve becomes really painful. You know, when you're talking about uh, something that you make five of, making 10 of it the next year, that's easy. And then maybe 20 of it the next year is also easy. But when you're going from, 
you know, making millions, uh, like Tesla did a million last year to two million, and, and, and everybody in the industry is trying to double in that, in that way, it, it, it does really become a scale problem. If we stay on pace, which we're currently at, like as an industry of growing 50% year on year, it, it does seem possible that within 20 years, the 300 to, or to 500 terawatt hours of batteries will be built. It's kind of nutty. It means we need to get the global annual you know, production capacity of batteries to like between 15 and 20 terawatt hours a year, which is crazy. Um, we're barely at a gigawatt hour now. Um, just to be clear, I think Drew got that wrong. We're not at one terawatt hour. A gigawatt hour, we're way over a gigawatt hour. We're like 700 gigawatt hours. But we need 1,000 gigawatt hours to get to a terawatt hour. So that's just a quick error that Drew made. It's massive growth. And the difference between, like, I don't know, growing um, iPhones by 50% a year and a car battery or grid storage at 50% a year should be obvious to all of you. Like, there's a lot more mass in a car than in a phone. And that mass has to come from somewhere. So ultimately, that mass, uh, largely the cathode, largely our highly refined uh, transition metal needs to come out of the ground. And with the like ore ratios that exist of you know, 100 to 1 or 50 to 1, if you're lucky, maybe, maybe you can get 20 to 1, depending on the resource. If you go to manganese, maybe you can get 10, 1, 10 to 1 or 5 to 1. It's still a lot of earth that needs to be moved at least once to get that 300 to 500 terawatt hours. So to be clear there, the challenge that Drew is talking about is you've got this material in the ground. The Earth's crust has plenty of all these elements. The challenge is that you have to go through the Earth's crust and extract, whether it's nickel, lithium, manganese, whatever, you have to extract all these materials from the Earth's crust, then refine them. But just the extraction alone, you have to move a lot of material to get out what you want. And if you have to move 100 tons of material to get one ton of what you need, that's a cost, that's a hurdle, that's a challenge. So I think that gives you a sense of the scale that's necessary and the challenge that's necessary. Next, Drew is gonna talk about the existing supply chain and at least implies that it needs to change drastically. For a while, the battery industry could scale within the constraints of the entire economy that exists of materials and of refining and of chemical production and everything. But we're not really there anymore. We need to invest in our own everything, which is an opportune time when you're investing in your own everything to reevaluate what you're investing in. Um, to date, the battery industry has been on the coattails of everybody else. So nothing has been like deliberately built for it. Mm -hmm. Full supply chain, that is true. You know, like the electrolyte is, is being built at some oil refinery that's doing a whole bunch of other petrochemicals. And like the electrolyte is a side business. And honestly, it's kind of annoying. You know, the graphite historically also has been coming out of some petrochemical process um, or, or, or maybe some coal mine kind of thing, um, but has, again, been sort of a secondary thing that they could make some money on. So you can see there what Drew is talking about. We need to totally remake the supply chain. And this is what I think we're going to hear from Tesla on Investor Day, is how are we going to remake the supply chain so you can reach the scale you need to reach. If you need to 20x everything, you can't do that within the, within the existing infrastructure. And then as long as you're going to do it, Drew's point, as long as you're going to do it, you might want to find a way to do it better. But it's everything. It's graphite. It's nickel. It's lithium. There's so many different things that go into these batteries. And when you're gonna scale the 20X of what you're doing now, more than 20X of what you're doing now, you have to come up with a new way of doing it. So this is gonna be the big thing that I think we're gonna hear on Investor Day. That's way more important than anything else. I think Wall Street will not understand it. Tesla Q will mock it. The short-term thinkers within the Tesla community will not see how that matters because it's not gonna matter for 2024. Not gonna matter for Q3 of 2023 or Q2 of 2023. It's going to matter going out to 2026 and 2030 that you can't achieve your long-term goals unless you secure the supply chain for those long-term goals. So this is where we need radical change. And this is the kind of thing that Tesla is really good at is how do we innovate in a big way to accomplish something over the top that nobody thought was possible? Because right now, leading thinkers within the mining, extraction, and refining areas don't think it's possible to get to the levels that Tesla is saying they need. Even Jeff Don doesn't think we're going to get there. Listen to Jeff Don, who is a Tesla researcher, works at a university in Canada. He's like one of the leading battery researchers in the world. Listen to him talk about it. So I mentioned some really daunting numbers at the beginning. 
we have to, based on 2019 numbers, we have to find 160,000 terawatt hours of energy every year to come from renewables. Just to be clear there, he's not talking about energy storage. He's talking about energy that would be produced by solar, wind, or whatever, in order to supply the energy that we use, that we need to run our lives. And then we're gonna to get to how that translates to battery storage now. So if you just say, we're gonna use solar and wind to generate all this, all this energy, and solar and wind are not, only, not always available, Let's just say that we have to store enough energy to power the planet for one day. Well, this is the yearly energy use. If you divide by 400, just to make the math easy, you would be using 400 terawatt hours of energy every single day. And if all that energy is gonna come from solar and wind and you wanna be able to store enough, for one day use, you would need 400 terawatt hours worth of batteries ultimately to be deployed. So I think you can see where Jeff Don is going there. That's where we get this 400 terawatt hour number. Drew was talking about 300 to 500 terawatt hours. I think I've heard Elon and Drew talking about 300 or 400 terawatt hours. So that's the ballpark of the amount of grid storage that's going to be needed or battery storage that's going to be needed to store all the energy that's going to be generated from solar and wind in a way that we can supply the energy needed for the world. Now, maybe this is an overestimate, maybe this is an underestimate. I think it's a, certainly a good ballpark estimate. Uh, this is a lot. World production of lithium ion batteries today is 0 0.3 terawatt hours. Don says 0 0.3 terawatt hours, which is 300 gigawatt hours. I've seen 700 gigawatt hours. I'm not sure what the correct number is. Uh, I don't know, I don't know that I need to know. You know, Tesla used about 100 gigawatt hours of batteries in 2022. I've seen that global production was 700 gigawatt hours, but Don knows more than I do, and he thinks it's 300 gigawatt hours or 0.3 terawatt hours. So I, I'd probably go with him over me. So if you got to go from 0.3 terawatt hours to 20 terawatt hours a year, that's like a 50 or 60x. It's a big, big jump. In 2030, it's estimated to be somewhere between two and six terawatt hours. So you would need this fleet of 400 terawatt hours of batteries deployed. So he's saying current estimates for how much batteries will be produced in 2030 is two to six terawatt hours. Now, Tesla alone says they're going to be deploying three terawatt hours of batteries in 2030. So where's all this coming from? And then you think about the importance of lifetime. The longer they last, the fewer need to be recycled and the fewer that one needs to make every year. Jeff Don's research focuses on the life cycles of batteries. If you can get batteries to last more cycles, if they can last longer, as he's going to explain, you need less of them. And, and you're, you get more value out of them. So if they last 50 years, that would mean to maintain this fleet of 400, you need to make eight terawatt hours of lithium ion batteries or some kind of advanced batteries every year. Eight times 50 is 400. And this is why we need really long lifetime batteries. And this is why it's a huge focus of my research effort. But then you have to ask the question, holy smokes, do we have the resources to deploy 400 terawatt hours of advanced batteries? Just as a sort of order of magnitude of, or a factor of two calculation, any single, any battery chemistry you can think of to deploy 400 terawatt hours of batteries, you'll need 500 million tons of positive electromaterial and 500 million tons of negative electromaterial. This is just massive amounts. So I think that's the key point. This, this comes back to this point. In order to achieve the goals we're talking about for 2030 and 2040 and beyond, we have to come up with a massive amount of materials that we currently don't have the infrastructure for. We don't have the supply chain for this. That's Jeff Don's point. That's something that Drew Baglino has been talking about. This is a huge challenge for the future. There hasn't been a lot of like dedicated investment in specific battery materials and refining processes. Um, and that is changing, which is great. It's a big opportunity for a lot of different players to dedicate their 
mental efforts towards something that is needed to achieve the scaling. I may have said this, but I want to say this again. If we shift the supply chain to a supply chain that's purpose built for batteries, that's designed to extract these materials in much higher volume and refine these materials in much higher volume, we may be able to actually lower the cost of getting the battery materials and lower the cost of producing batteries and lower the cost of producing electric vehicles and lower the cost of producing mega packs and power walls and everything else that we're, we're hoping to achieve in shifting to a, a future of sustainable energy and sustainable transportation. It's specific to battery making, like the cathode synthesis or, or how electrodes are made or uh, cells are assembled and battery packs are made. Sure, there's been bespoke investment. It's a bunch of unique stuff. But even that is, is not scalable like it needs to be to go to the huge multiple we're talking about. So the point is that they're trying to get to this huge multiple, trying to massively expand the scale of battery production, which requires a massive expansion and scale of battery material extraction and refining. And even though there's been some progress, we need something bigger. And this is what I think we're going to hear on, on Investor Day. This is what I think Master Plan 3 is going to be about. The, the fundamental thing that Master Plan 3 is going to be about is not a particular vehicle, not a particular platform, not some development in FSD or robo-taxi, but you can't get robo-taxi to supply all the transportation to the world if you don't have enough batteries to support the robo-taxis. I mean, I do think if the Generation 3 platform is much more efficient and the design works really well, Maybe you can use fewer batteries per robo-taxi vehicle, but the vast majority of the batteries going out past 2030 are going to be going into grid storage. So the vehicle, prop, solving the vehicle problem a little, reducing the amount of battery cells needed for a vehicle, makes some dent, but not enough. In other words, if a Gen 3 vehicle only needs a 40 kilowatt hour pack, where a Model Y typically has an 80 kilowatt hour pack, you've reduced by half the, the amount of battery materials and batteries you need to supply that. And that's an important step. But you still, the scale of batteries you need is so off the charts that this is a huge problem. And let's be clear, the big nut here is lithium. Lithium, lithium, lithium. Lithium is the big challenge. It's the one nut we need. People think sodium might be the answer. Drew addresses that. Uh, Jeff Don addressed that at one point. Uh, but let's listen to Drew here. This risk area at the moment, again, I mentioned lithium like three times already, is, is really lithium. So how can academia help? There's tons of ways, like uh, better ways to do direct lithium extraction out of brines, out of uh, uh, various different types of ways in which lithium ends up in water, like in the Solars and other things like that. More extensible resins for things like ion exchange membranes for getting uh, lithium purified. I mentioned it, I'll mention it again, like, Oil field lithium, there's a ton of lithium in oils. There's lots of ways to like rethink the lithium problem um, and remove fossil fuel inputs into the lithium refining process, uh, find ways to actually sequester CO2 in the lithium extraction process. There's tons of stuff that's exciting, but not yet fully there. So you can see Drew is really focused on lithium. Lithium is, is probably the biggest nut. Well, why lithium? Why not something else, like maybe sodium? And there's a lot of work going on with sodium in academia and in the startup world, where if it were possible to, to get sodium to be as compelling as lithium is, especially for grid storage, where energy density doesn't really matter, it's more about let, you know, let, well, the life cycle of, of energy, you know, maybe we do sodium for, for the grid, which like greatly reduces the need to scale lithium. These are the kinds of things that partnership between academia and industry can enable this 50% year-on-year growth of energy storage for all the ways in which energy storage can, you know, decarbonize the grid and transport um, happen sooner, uh, well, happen more facilely, I guess. Like, ultimately, the current road of, like, lithium or bust is, is possible, very possible. There's plenty of lithium. It just would be great if there was just, like, one more, one more entree at the table. Uh, so sodium might help, and other things like that might help. Drew is not saying sodium is the answer. Drew is saying sodium might be the answer, and he's talking about the academic research that's necessary to get there. Jeff Don also talked about sodium, that sodium doesn't have the cycle life needed to get where you need to be. And it, it's lower energy density than lithium iron phosphate, and it doesn't have the cycle life. Well, as a battery scientist, this is our playground, the periodic table, and this is all we have to work with to build uh, better batteries, okay? And if you ask the question, which of these elements is abundant enough 
to be used in batteries at the scale in 2030, where we're going to be building between two and six terawatt hours of batteries per year. Notice he said two and six terawatt hours of batteries a year. I think at battery day, Elon and Drew were talking about the world needed to build 10 terawatt hours of batteries a year. So Don is being conservative here. I think the need is greater than what he's talking about here. And this is one of Tesla's leading battery researchers. This guy knows more than I do. Um, and he knows more about the world of batteries than I do and everything. But I think he's actually not recognizing how big, he, he recognizes how big it is. I don't think he recognizes how big Tesla's ambitions are. If you assume that lithium is abundant enough to be used at 2030 scale, lithium has an abundance in the Earth's crust of 20 parts per million. And if you assume that any other element that has an abundance of 20 parts per million or more can be used at the 2030 scale, this is the part of the periodic table that remains here. And he's talking about 20 parts per million. I think he's talking about something similar to what Drew talked about earlier in terms of ore ratios. How much of the Earth's crust do you have to move in order to get the materials you need? And here he's talking about you know greater than 20 parts per million. And what you're going to see is when we're heading up to the 2040 scale where he's anticipating we're going to need a lot more battery production, this is going to change. But that's a 2030. We're going to need a factor of 10, a factor of even more than 10, uh, more, more material to service the needs of energy storage from solar or wind. And if you ask the question, what elements are available at a factor of 10 more abundance? This is what the periodic table looks like. There's not much left, you know. So at the scale that we need for energy storage to eliminate fossil fuels, look what's remaining. What's no longer available is lithium, right? If there isn't enough lithium, how are you gonna produce the batteries? And this is going out past 2030, out to 2040. At some point, we're gonna to need to find something other than lithium, is Don's interpretation. Now you heard Drew Baglino say there is enough lithium. So there's a little bit of a back and forth there. I think that, Drew knows that Tesla is developing something that will allow them to get enough lithium out of the ground despite the relatively low concentration of lithium in the ground. Because the Earth's crust is monstrously huge, so there's a lot of stuff there. Getting it out is a challenge, and I think that's something that Don may not know about that Drew knows about, because Drew knows a lot. I, while I think Don knows more than me, I'm not sure he knows more than Drew. And it's fortunate, it's very fortunate, that from these elements remaining, we can make a pretty darn good sodium ion battery using sodium, manganese and iron, and carbon as the negative electrode material. So he's basically talking here about the equivalent of a lithium iron phosphate battery or a lithium iron graphite battery, I guess. You've got iron, you've got manganese for the cathode, you've got carbon or graphite for the anode, and you've got sodium for the the active, I don't know if that's not really the electrolyte, but the that's the energy, the ions that are crossing back and forth between cathode and anode. So, you know, he can see, I think he sees a path in the research to getting sodium ion batteries to the point where they add enough value that they can take the place in grid storage of a lot of lithium ion batteries. That's, that's my best read of what he's talking about here. So the sodium ion battery is the cousin of the lithium ion battery. It's just now starting to be developed. It will have a lower energy density than lithium ion. It will mean that you'll need a larger battery to store the same amount of energy. You'll need a heavier battery to stage, store the same amount of energy. And at the moment, the lifetime of sodium ion batteries does not match lithium ion batteries. So there's a lot of work to do. We need to get this decades long lifetime from sodium ion, and we need this sustainable chemistry for the future. So this is a key point. I hear people saying, oh, they're gonna announce sodium ion batteries. And Jeff Don, who is probably the world's leading battery researcher, one of the world's leading battery researchers says, sodium ion isn't there yet. It doesn't have the lifetime necessary. Grid storage batteries need to have long life, long lifetimes. They need to last a long time. Otherwise the capital investment you make to supply that energy storage isn't sufficient. So. Jeff Don and others are working on making sodium ion batteries get to the point where they are viable as a replacement for lithium ion batteries. 
And just to be clear, anybody who tells you sodium ion's coming, and there may be some sodium ion batteries coming out, but they lack the lifetime and they lack the energy density of lithium ion batteries. Maybe we'll get there in the future. We'll see. Don seems optimistic we will get there. It's just a question of how long it takes. Okay, so if I wasn't clear, getting battery materials is the most important thing we're going to hear at Investor Day. I think they're going to talk about it at some length, and that's going to be the big nut. That's not what everybody's going to talk about after. That's what I'm going to talk about after. And I'll bet you Jordan Geese keeping the limiting factor is going to focus on that as well. The thing that's easiest for people to understand is probably the Generation 3 vehicle. They will definitely talk about that. But, you know, in order to get these materials, number one, you need to have a, a better process for getting the materials, and you probably need to have a good place to get them. There's been a lot of talk about Indonesia. There's been a lot of talk about Canada. It may be that they'll announce new operations in Indonesia and Canada for this. That's a possibility for lithium and nickel extraction and refining, and maybe for other battery materials. We'll see. But lithium, lithium very clearly appears to be the number one problem right now. Not for 2023, not for 2024, but going out to 2025, 26, 2030 and beyond. Looking at the long times between now and when we're going to need that lithium, the action activity has to start now to get there. And that's what I expect they're going to present. Now, the next thing that they've told us they're going to present is the Generation 3 vehicle platform. And I believe it's not just the Generation 3 vehicle platform, but it's also the factory that's going to build the Generation 3 vehicle platform. Tesla doesn't look at it as we're just making a vehicle. We're making a vehicle that's designed to be manufactured in high volume. And so we're making a factory that's designed to manufacture the vehicle in high volume. You have to design the vehicle to be made, so like a back and forth. How do you make the factory to make the vehicle in high volume? How do you make the vehicle to be made in high volume? While, of course, making an efficient vehicle. And I think one of the goals is getting high miles per kilowatt hour, getting the most out of your battery pack. Right now, a Model 3, the Model 3 is probably the most efficient Tesla, probably about four and a half miles a kilowatt hour. Can they get this next generation vehicle to six miles a kilowatt hour? If you can get to six miles a kilowatt hour and you give it a 40 kilowatt hour pack, you've got 240 miles of range, which isn't what you and I want for driving a car, but that might be sufficient for robo taxi use. That could be critical. And I'm gonna, and I'm gonna hit on this point again. You can't achieve scale in Cybertruck, in Semi, with the Gen 3 platform vehicle, with Megapack, with Powerwall. None of this stuff can scale until you have sufficient batteries to get there. And projections about, you know, wild projections about how many megapacks we're going to see in 2030, I believe them, but we have to have an answer to where is the battery material is going to come from. How are we going to get there? A couple other things. I'm not sure this is going to come up in Investor Day. I think people are underestimating the Model 3 and Model Y and the Generation 3 platform. I hear people saying, I keep hearing people saying, oh, Tesla needs a $30,000 car. Model 3 is the $30,000 car. It's currently selling for $33,000 at the low end in China. Drew has said they can squeeze another $2,500 or so out of the cost of building Model 3 and Model Y. We're seeing some sort of re layout of how they're producing Model 3 in Giga Shanghai. Model 3 and Model Y are the $30,000 car. Model Y doesn't cost that much more to produce than Model 3. Well, right now, it probably costs less to produce Model Y than Model 3, but as they continue to find efficiencies in producing these vehicles, they could probably drop Model 3 and Y down to $30,000 and still make a profit as they're scaling. And another thing that I keep hearing people talking about is, quote, Project Highland, which as far as I know, Tesla has never confirmed the existence of Project Highland. Sounds like Project Highland is a Model 3 refresh. Model 3, you know, the way Tesla engineers, if you watch Joe Justice, if you watch Sandy Monroe, Tesla is constantly innovating and constantly changing how they make vehicles. So the big change that's probably coming, and this isn't a surprise, and you don't need a Project Highland to get there, is that at some point they're probably going to transition Model 3 to front and rear castings. And if you transition Model 3 to front and rear castings, it means, it means you have fewer parts, fewer processes. The best part is no part. The best process is no process. And you're using less factory floor space. So now you're freeing up factory floor space so you can produce more of something else or produce another line of what you're doing. There's a lot of potential there as well. But the Generation 3 vehicle platform is far more important to Tesla's future than Model 3 or even Model Y. The Generation 3 vehicle is not a $25,000 car. This is short-termers who don't fully understand the business, aren't thinking long-term, and don't see that a $25,000 car would not be that much of an improvement over Model 3 and Model Y. 
it's going to be a $20,000 or less car. If they're currently selling Model 3 for $33,000, and they could probably get Model 3 down to $30,000 if they pushed, that means the Generation 3 vehicle could ultimately be sold for $15,000 or $18,000. So we're talking about a Corolla killer. It's not a Camry killer, it's a Corolla killer. That's going to be the big deal. Number, And it's not so much that they're going to produce a vehicle at that low cost and they're going to sell it to customers. That's part of it. But ultimately, it's you're going to be running this vehicle in robo-taxi use. You want it to last a million miles. And if you can get the cost of the vehicle, producing the vehicle down as low as possible, you're reducing how much you have to amortize over that million miles. And that allows you to drive the cost per mile down. If you have a $20,000 vehicle and you drive it a million, dollar, a million miles, that's two cents a mile for amortizing the vehicle. If you can get it down to $15,000, now it's a penny and a half a mile. And when you add all the other costs in of operating the vehicle, you can see where you can drive the cost of the vehicle down, you can drive the cost of operating it down, and you can drive the price of a robo-taxi ride down as you scale the robo-taxi network. I do expect that we're going to learn something more about the Generation 3 vehicle during Investor Day. Things like, what are they doing to improve efficiency? Are they going to use larger castings? Are they going to do 48 volt wiring? Are they going to use the thousand volt architecture that they've already announced is going to be in Cybertruck? Are they going to do some kind of twist on motors like they've done with the plaid motors for semi, where they're able to create some kind of plaid style motor that runs for efficiency rather than high performance and get a little bit more? Because if you can eke an extra two, one or two percent efficiency out of the motor, because of the way regen works, you're actually getting another three or 4% efficiency out of your vehicle if you do it right. So they already have highly efficient motors, but every little bit you can eke out gets you just don't get any gain you make effectively doubles because of, of regen. Now, I have a theory. We've seen a hint today or yesterday. We saw a hint yesterday that the FSD hardware 4 is out, that their Tesla's currently installing hardware 4, at least in some Model Xs that haven't been delivered yet. Elon has said that hardware 4 will be in Cybertruck. Now, I have a theory, because Elon mentioned hardware 5, that the Generation 3 platform vehicle will actually use hardware 5 rather than hardware 4. From what Green said, hardware 4 is not as much of an improvement as I was expecting, and that and Elon has said hardware 5 is coming. Well, what would hardware 5 be coming for? With respect to upgrading cars on, that have hardware 3, I, I don't think that will be needed. Um, hardware 3 will not be as as good as hardware 4, but I'm confident that hardware 3 will still far exceed the average, the safety of the average human. You know, let's say for argument's sake, if um, hardware 3 can be, say, two or 300 percent safer than human, hardware 4 might be, you know, five or 600 percent. There will be a hardware 5 beyond that. But um, what, what really matters is, 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 are we improving the uh, average safety on the road. It's coming for the RoboTaxi platform vehicle. The RoboTaxi platform vehicle goes into production in 2024, won't be delivered till 2025. Cybertruck is 2023. So it, it, they're, they're apparently already shipping hardware four. So that's two years later. That's within the development cycle you would expect. So the generation three vehicle is going to be the one that's going to have the most advanced hardware for self-driving. It'll have a fast, faster chip. It may have better cameras. You know, there's going to be other advantages to it. And they may tell us something about that at Investor Day, but I doubt it. So I'm, I'm going to make, I said this earlier, but I'm going to make a prediction that the Generation 3 platform vehicle will start with a 40 kilowatt hour lithium iron phosphate pack, will get six miles per kilowatt hour of, of efficiency and have a 240 mile range. That's a prediction. I, I might be wrong. Got to be less wrong. I don't think they're going to talk much about Cybertruck at this event. I don't think they're going to talk much about Semi at this event. They just had a Semi event. Cybertruck event is probably coming this summer or this fall. I don't expect them to talk much about Megapack, although energy storage is an important part of the future. So they may talk about energy in some way. I don't think they're going to talk about BOT. I don't think they're going to talk about FSD at Investor Day. FSD is something for a different topic. And I think BOT, is that's more like an artificial intelligence topic. You, you never know what they're going to talk about. My gut is they're not going to talk about that. It may be that they're going to, we're, we're due for next generation Powerwall. So maybe we'll see that. Powerwall seems to have been slow. There seems to be a lot of hope for it. I'm not sure what other event you would announce Powerwall at. So Powerwall might be a good thing to announce and maybe talking about how they're going to expand solar and Powerwall because we've been waiting on that for a while. How are they going to get Tesla energy to grow? Because Tesla energy is supposed to be growing fast. What's the explanation for how? Obviously need the batteries, but what else do we need? I also think there's some chance that they will announce lithium iron phosphate 4680 cell production plants. 
uh, lithium iron phosphate and maybe the lithium iron phosphate will be doped with manganese for extra energy density or some other way of incorporating manganese in the chemistry. Nickel is, there's a shortage of nickel. There may be some value in having another type of battery. Lithium iron phosphate is something that Tesla very clearly likes using. Producing cylindrical cells can be done at scale, maybe more effectively than prismatic or rectangular box cells that LFP is commonly done in. So I think there's a chance they're going to do that. And I think in particular, there's a chance they're going to announce that the million square feet they've leased in Houston might be for lithium iron phosphate 4680 cell production. But that's a wild guess. I don't know where else they'd produce lithium iron phosphate 4680s. A lot of people think they are going to do that. It is possible that they'll announce plans for Generation 3 gigafactories. My predictions are Japan and South Korea. Elon made a mention. There's been a lot of talk about you want your factories close to your customers. Japan is the third largest car market in the world. South Korea has a big car market. I think we're going to see Generation 3 gigafactories in Japan, South Korea, the United States, Europe, uh, and maybe even India. But I'm not sure they're going to make those announcements at this event other than to just generally say they're going to do it. What do you think about Investor Day? What do you think is coming? Let me know in the comments below. Check out the t-shirts at elonbits.com, especially the Tesla Man t-shirt and the Drew Baglino Fan Club t-shirt, of course, and all the other t-shirts, uh, Tesla's the next Tesla, et cetera, elonbits.com. Please support me on the Locals platform on Patreon or as a YouTube channel member. Links to all that in the description below. Check out my other videos. Please like this video, share, and subscribe. And thank you so much for watching.